Hi, everyone, and welcome to this second YouTube live stream that we're doing from the Axelos headquarters, which is currently located in what used to be my daughter's bedroom. Uh, we have a fabulous panel with us today, uh, probably the best panel we've ever put together, uh, and I'll introduce you uh, to them in a moment. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to also direct everyone's attention to some of the other content that we have on our YouTube channel. Uh, our producer, uh, Harry, has also been uh, doing some pretty funny videos around, uh, uh, which he's called the PPM Historian, talking about how you can use Prince2 or MSP to manage the Great Fire of London or um, manage uh, changes to the um, uh, aerospace industry when the Icelandic volcano with the unpronounceable name exploded some years ago and so on. <laughs> it's absolutely fabulous stuff. Um, so do take a look at the Axelos YouTube channel for lots of video content coming your way. Having said that, let's move to our panelists. So I'll go uh, anti-clockwise around my screen. So starting with Sigma. Uh, Sigma is uh, based in Norway. Uh, she was actually uh, one of the uh, founding members of um, ITSM Norway in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, since then, she's worked in the IT service management space, as she puts it, across multiple frameworks uh, for, for many, many years. So whether that's ITIL, Prince2, Lean, Agile, DevOps, and possibly several others which uh, could come to mind. Sig if, if it exists, Sigma's probably done some work with it. Uh, most recently, she's also been a co-author of the ITIL4 publication, Drive Stakeholder Value. Uh, and it is to explore some of the ideas in that book, as well as some of her experience uh, in the field that uh, we've asked her to join us today. So Sigma, welcome. Uh, is there anything that I should be plugging that I haven't plugged, a website, a Twitter account, anything like that? Well, um, website, I, 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 uh, I, some years ago, I started on my own after 16 years in BNVGL, which is a, a quite similar company to uh, Lloyd's. And uh, I think being consultant there has been a great thing because we were called on when everything was uh, went wrong at the customer yeah. side and needed to figure out why. And it's an incredible lot of learning in that. So a lot of those projects, uh, and we learn a lot and uh, what does not work. And in 2017, I started on my own. I uh, called my company the Team Builders, Team Bigane in uh, Norwegian. So uh, I can maybe, uh, that it's just uh, www.teambigane.no because it's Norway. <laughs> awesome. I think when, when after after we finish this live stream, we'll come back to the show notes of the podcast and put, we'll we'll try to put a link to that uh, website as well, so people can know where to find you. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've loved about my time here at Axlos is that I've uh, I've come into contact with people from all around the world, speaking uh, all sorts of different languages, including my colleague today, Alan Thompson who's the product ambassador for the project and portfolio management suite. Uh, Alan is, um, uh, is Scottish, uh, which you might uh, say from your, uh, tell from your accent. Um, he's been very active in the field of project and portfolio management, not only as an ambassador, but prior to joining Axelos with companies like uh, British Petroleum, British Gas, and many, many others. Um, one of the reasons I asked him to join us today is because the management of value is not only a best practice body of knowledge, but we have some interesting uh, perspectives of what value means from a project or a portfolio or a program management perspective and how that aligns with how the rest of the organization sees this term value. So Alan, thank you so much for giving us your time uh, this evening. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Ashley, and uh, thank you for that excellent introduction. And uh, looking forward to this the discussion tonight. Uh, and value, uh, what a topic to discuss. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the consensus at the end of the era regarding value. But uh, looking forward to it. Much appreciated. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And last but certainly not least is uh, Mr. Gaming Works himself. Well, I should. Mr. Cole, Game, uh, Cole, Mr. Gaming Works, I should say, uh, Paul Wilkinson, one half of the company Gaming Works, along with Jan Schilt, uh, 
GameWorks has been building uh, business simulations for many, many years now that help organizations experience some of the challenges when it comes to adopting various frameworks, um, such as ITIL, DevOps, uh, project management frameworks, and so on. Uh, you may have heard of a number of uh, his uh, simulation games. Uh, his latest is uh, Marslander, uh, which has been very successful all around the world from what I can see from his LinkedIn and Twitter profile. But he's also, uh, GamingWorks also has, um, let's see, uh, Challenge of Egypt. Uh, the uh, I always refer to this as the pizza sim uh, delivery simulation, but I'm sure there's an official title for it, Paul. Grab a pizza. Grab, Grab a pizza, pizza, that's the one. Yeah. And then there was uh, um, the Phoenix Project, as I said. Uh, so there are many, many simulations, and Paul and Jan have been the, the brains behind building that simulation out, as well as conducting it and distilling the knowledge across thousands and thousands of engagements. Uh, and so he joins us here today because he sees this term value as a very loaded term in a lot of his engagements. And uh, he's here to share with us some of the conversations he's had from CXOs all the way down to engineers about the term value and what it means. So, Paul, thank you for joining us as well. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. As we discussed before we started, this is probably one of the most complex subjects there is at the moment, this whole thing around value. What on earth are we talking about value? That I said, I don't think we'll be able to answer the questions within the 40 minutes. I think we'll probably raise more questions than we actually <laughs> answer in these 40 minutes. <laughs> and the only other thing that you didn't mention, perhaps that I'd like to also mention is, we also produce that ABC of IT, the attitude, behavior, culture in IT. And I think a lot of what we're gonna talk about will come down to that attitudes and behaviors around value management. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and you know what? We have such an amazing panel. I think you're selling yourself short. I'm pretty sure we'll come up with an answer by 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, in the background, we have a couple of people from Axelos who are keeping, a, uh, who are keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, they're going to be feeding me some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. So we'll be talking about uh, the management or the measurement of value uh, for uh, the next half an hour or so. And then we'll be switching to um, addressing some of the questions that have been coming in. So keep those questions coming, guys. You know, we, we want to hear back from you as well. So let's start by defining this term value. Um, I've encountered a lot of perspectives. Most of those perspectives, it has to be said, comes down to financial value or economic value. It's, it's measured in dollars, pounds, krona, euros, whatever it might be. But what is value? Is, is it just financial value? And Sigma, I'll come to you first, since um, I'll follow the same order as the introductions. Um, why don't we come to you first? How would you explain value to, to your colleagues, to your clients? Of course, um, I, uh, I think the, the uh, definition in the ITIL book is a usefulness or benefit or a, a how it's perceived by someone. So it's very subjective and that's the problem. And I think uh, it's so good to, uh, to raise the question because uh, it's time to, uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, discuss what value means because uh, often we put it in kind of a little frame that team look for value for them or the business look for value for them only. But now we have a focus on this co-creation of value, and we need to put the perspective higher. And I think uh, in the principles of ITIL 4, it's very good, focus on value, but even more important uh, is uh, think practically when you talk about value. I think that is something we need to do. I can Absolutely. talk a lot. Just <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good summary. And for those of you in the audience uh, watching who are not familiar with this phrase, co-creation of value, it's something that um, the science of service management talks about a lot, um, which is where we found uh, some of the literature that ultimately influenced a lot of what we wrote in ITIL 4. Um, the co-creation of value principle uh, or uh, concept essentially says that um, value is only created when multiple parties, at least two parties, come together and perform actions together, whether that's um, uh, accessing each other's resources, whether that's executing some task or work on their side, etc. But it's only when 
these parties come together and engage in some sort of a transaction together, that value is created. And that's a step shift away from the more traditional perspectives of value where, you know, I mean, I've been a service delivery manager in the past and I've always, I've talked about delivering value as in my organization has done something and we've delivered value. And as Sigma rightly pointed out, ITIL4 takes a, a huge uh, uh, left turn away from that uh, and talks about co-creation of value. So both the provider and the customer or consumer have certain responsibilities. Paul, I'd imagine that this concept is something that gets explored quite early on in uh, many of the simulations, including Mars Lander. But um, how, how does this, this concept of co-creation land with your clients? And, but, and more broadly, go, going back to the same question I asked Sigma, um, how, have you seen the sort of friction caused by different opinions of what value means as part of your simulations? I think that's probably the biggest thing that comes across in all of the simulations, and it's what's been triggering me for the last 40 years of being in IT, this whole concept of value. Value is just a meaningless concept that everybody's got a totally different opinion as to what value is. And one of the top chosen worst practice cards, it's the same card chosen year in, year out for the last 15 years in a row. The top chosen ABC card is IT has too little understanding of business impact and priority because we don't know what value means to the business. Now, often when we play our business simulation, we've got different business roles in the game. We've got a sales director, we've got a marketing director, we've got a logistics director, we've got a business as usual director. And they've all got a different perspective on what value is. You're right. Some of them, like the sales director says, value is all about revenue. It's all about making my profit. The business as usual director says, no value for me is continuity. It's trust. It's our image. It's our reputation. It's our credibility in the market. Uh, customers, the customer relationship said, no, it's all about customer satisfaction, customer experience, customer loyalty. So they're all explaining value from a different perspective. And then you've got the IT people coming in saying value to us is meeting the service level agreements. Value to us is 99.98 uptime availability. Look how much value we're delivering. I play the mission director in one of these simulations and I'm totally confused. <laughs> all I want is people to actually ask me, what does value look like? But there's something that, that every simulation so far, we are very, very bad at actually engaging with stakeholders just to have the discussion. What does value mean to you? Tell me what is the most valuable thing we can contribute to you. We don't have those discussions. So mm -hmm. a lot of it comes down to we make assumptions of what value is. And as you quite rightly started off with, a lot of people think value comes down to revenue in the end. That's right. Uh, so, Alan, then with the backdrop of, of what Sigma and Paul have been describing, what does the uh, project and portfolio management body of not bodies of knowledge say about this term? Uh, I mean, there's a, there's an entire body of knowledge called the management of value. Um, yeah. We could start there, but we can also cherry pick from others. But what's your perspective on this term? Well, we, within MOV, uh, basic, which is management value, it, it does state that value itself is subjective. It can be subjective based on the perceptions of individual stakeholders. And I think what MOV tries to do is it tries to say that introduce a, a framework to basically make a, a baseline description of value across the organization so that we don't have these subjective interpretations of value, which I've actually found in um, running programs and projects and, and portfolios before Axelos, whereby value to one stakeholder does not mean the same value to another. And that's where you get the perceptions, uh, the buy-in or the lack of buy-in because they don't have this understanding. So what MOV terms attempts to put in place is the, the a framework which is agreed across the organization about what it means. But the, the problem you've got is that the interpretation of value comes back to the People sometimes, stakeholders, get mixed up with what the, the values they have themselves as individuals rather than what's individually correct thing for the organization. Yeah. Uh, within the PPM sector, I mean, <clears throat> it's a bit like what uh, what ITO4 uh, is doing as well, is it? it's pr promoting co-creation of value across boundaries and reducing silo mentality. And, and that's really important as well. But I, th I think it's uh, it's really important. You know, you, we got a common 
a common definition of what value is, and that's that's the real challenge. Because the other thing that goes into the mix, it would be good if all value was financial, but you've got aspects within uh, organizations where value comes from non-financial benefits like improved customer satisfaction, employee, increased employee satisfaction. And what you have, a, what we say from benefits management perspective is you've got to work your way back to a financial statement. And then when you're de dealing with stakeholders who are expecting, I just want to know about cu customer satisfaction. That's what I value within my organization. So it's hugely, hugely complex. Yes. Not only is it hugely complex in that sense, you've also got the fact that value changes over time as well. Yes. So what might be valuable this quarter in this volatile, uncertain world of digital transformation and rapid change, what is valuable today might not be valuable tomorrow. So if we have such a volatile environment, then, I mean, thinking of organizational continuity and, and so on, if isn't there a danger then that organizations will be jumping from one thing to another, uh, which leads to uh, wasted effort, it leads to wasted resources, uh, it leads to confusion, not only within the organization, but within the marketplace, because mm -hmm. you know the organization seems to be co constantly sort of chasing, chasing its own tail, trying to determine what value is. You know, we can't stop, in a way, Paul, uh, can we make the argument that organizations can't afford to stop and ask themselves that question? Um, Sigma, is this a, a, thing, a dilemma that you've seen with your uh, clients? Uh, that you know they're, they're too busy delivering BAU that they don't have the time to stop and ask themselves, well, what is actually valuable? How do we reconfigure it so that we can change? I, I, I think... Um, uh... Well, the answer is yes. It's a really that they don't discuss really what value is, and also I think what you mentioned in the start is a a big trouble that we are living in a paradigm where it's uh, all about economical growth. Uh, everything that creates profit is uh, value to the business, and without thinking about the consequences of making products cheaper and cheaper and selling more and more. And uh, as long as the consumers are there to buy and uh, kind of, then it's uh, when we have that as the economy as a leading star for value, that creates a lot of trouble. Yeah, and yeah. that uh, reflects down the full organization because every department is kind of, oh, our numbers need to be as good as possible. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, getting back to that point as well, uh, actually, where you say, can we ever keep up with this? For example, that what Signa said, chasing value at the moment. Now, a lot of companies chase the revenue. They chase the bottom line. That's what they mm -hmm. want. They go for revenue. But suddenly you get something like environmentally friendly and suddenly you get the environment being a big thing for the people, the consumers. They will suddenly drop a company that just focuses on profit because they say, hey, we, we respect companies that are now environmentally friendly. And you suddenly lost your whole of your customer base, mm -hmm. which is why the world is changing so fast. You've got to respond to these external influences as they happen, which means you need to speed up your ability to make your strategic choices and then mm. speed up the translation from those strategic choices all the way through the end-to-end -end chain to make sure that value pops out. Mm. But there's something, A, we're bad at understanding what value is, and B, we're really bad at actually translating that end-to-end. -end. We've all got our own little silos with our own little definitions of our silos value, and then mm. suddenly this thing comes from some strategic place up there, and it takes a long time before it gets through to the end, if it ever does. Mm. Yeah. And, and a lot of your organizations, Paul, basically, who are trying to cope with that are like doing focus groups yep. so to see how the values of individual customers, what they value, yep. is changing. But then again, from a focus group, the research then has got to be built into your organization and changed accordingly. Therefore, again, you've got the challenge of BAU versus change and, and improving yep. the service delivery. I know, Alan, that we were having this conversation recently around 
you know, if if the perception of value is changing, or if the value if the if what organizations value or, or defined to be value changes this rapidly in uh, or changes more rapidly than it has, how are you know large programs of change ever supposed to deliver against a, a moving goalpost? And I, I think you were talking about how, for example, some of the um, guidance in uh, something like managing successful programs might be able mm. to help with some of that. Could you could you elaborate on that for for our yeah. Audience? Yeah, because within managing successful programs, um, uh, within a, a program itself, it, it's a cyclic, it's a cycle, and it's it's slow, takes on board where you're con constantly um, looking at the environment and then making small changes to your business to make sure it's still aligned. And because you've got that adaptability and it's small, it, it's like taking a long time within a cycle, then you're able to change your business accordingly. Um, but I mean, so that's that's like program management and iterative, I don't mean get mixed up with Agile here, but an iterative gradual response to see how the actual environment's actually changing. And um, I mean, that takes into consideration, I mean, Booker, Excel, and Volatile, on certain complex yeah. and biggest environments, but it's a gradual change. Is this going to affect where we need to be? Or guess what? We stop and then we can then restart again as well. But um, it, 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 a lot of a lot of what organisations have got to do now is because of that, the world we live in, they've got to look out and be able to respond to that effectively. Uh, and, and, and here you see as well partly the shift, partly the shift for some ways that program management has been put in place takes too long. Yeah. They're lengthy decision-making cycles. And then you see the shift to companies moving towards product teams and product ownership and giving product teams their own budget, not part of the yearly budget cycle, but small budgets where they can quickly respond to a market need. So they create some sort of digital innovation pool mm -hmm. in the company that responds to digital transformation needs. And they're trying to generate new forms of value while business as usual carries on sometimes within the program structure because that's longer, longer decision cycles and something that they're happy to control in those lengthy terms. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's, it's a different type of value that suddenly has to pop out. And also, Paul, that costs a bit of money for organizations to have these innovation centers yeah. within their organization as well. It does. And these are things that lots of companies are now struggling with. You know, what is the best model? Everybody's telling us we've got to shift to this product focused model. Everybody's telling us we suddenly got to shift towards value stream thinking and value chains. ITIL's talking about value streams. Lean DevOps is talking about value streams. Nobody knows how to do it because there's no real best practices. So everybody is struggling. How can we create value as quickly as possible? Because the world is changing where speed and agility is so critical that they want speed to new value. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, but let me come back to the uh, a point we were discussing a few moments ago, which is the the conflict that uh, essentially that arises when different teams have a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and I think you know there may be some in our audience who might think, um, you know, what sort what sort of conflict are, are you talking about? You know, everyone in our organization works harmoniously, and we're all collegial and and pally with each other, and 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 so on. Um, but but let's let's explore that a little bit. So, Sigma, in in your consulting engagements, um, have you come across this sort of friction? And can you share, for example, some of the most commonly encountered teams who have these different uh, perspectives on on value? Um, so so uh, examples from the real life where it's conflicting values. Uh, uh, what popped up in my mind right now was uh, not between teams uh, within the company, but I have plenty of examples of that as, uh, as well, of course. Uh, but uh, I uh, worked once with, uh, or I have several projects of that as well, between service provider and uh, customer or a consumer organization, where it has been a lot of... Uh, conflicts and 
they blaming each other and they uh, when it, when we come to into it is kind of both focusing on uh, maximizing value for their own sake and avoid penalties or prove we need penalties uh, even if it's not penalties within the company we have the same uh, kind of uh, just in a management uh, group there could be a, a, a well, I'm called in when things does not work quite often. And then we see that a management group kind of team building for those people. Well, they are there only to build their own uh, department strong. Hello, you're in the same boat. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's both between uh, internal uh, parties in an organization and also a service provider and a customer or consumer organization that have made a partnership or a important service uh, they want to figure out together, they are in the same boat. Hello. <laughs> I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example as well. Actually, this is a, a one exactly the conflict you're talking about. Uh, we had an organization, we, we put the whole team in the Mars lander and they recognized that in the game, the product owner wouldn't invest in solving some of the technical debt or issues or incidents because they were low priority. So in the game, the product owner said, I'll only solve priority one incidents because that's within my budget. Priority three incidents are not in my budget. They're in the IT operations budget. Now, the poor service level manager was trying to get these issues solved, but couldn't get the resources because the product owner says, you're not having my resources and it's not coming out of my budget. So we then said to the product owner, do you mind if we now find out what is the impact of these low priority issues? Go ahead. So we went and interviewed customers. All it was was one field from a screen got dropped. And when the screen refreshed, you had to fill in the whole screen again and the next screen. This was a banking application. We interviewed people from the 200 people we interviewed, 20 of them had left the company and gone to a different bank because they said, we're fed up of the impact of this to our business. So then we went back to the product owner and he said, how am I supposed to know that? My job is new features, revenue growth. That's what I'm doing. I'm generating new revenue for our customers. They're existing customers. And if we lose them, that's not my KPI. My KPI is not customer satisfaction and customer retention and customer loyalty. So here you see, because there was no strategic goals to actually say, how do you deal now with conflicting value parameters? How do you deal with that? There was no way of dealing with it. And in the end, everybody just got frustrated. Or it mm. turned out to whoever shouts the loudest gets their priority value done first. Mm. Mm. And, and Alan, do you have a, an example from maybe your experience or... or some organizations you've talked to that oh yeah I, i'd actually give it from it from experience actually with, when i was working uh, with with a, with a couple of organizations uh, who will remain nameless may I add uh, and uh, what it was it was just it was a bit like what paul was saying that we're in the same program dealing the same objective and i was a bit like sigma parachuted then to try and sort the problem out and each part of the organization were doing what they were tasked with doing according to what they were asked to achieve. But because A was given the, the product to B too late, even though they were satisfying what they were doing, B were always behind. B always were a problem. B weren't a problem because they were getting information from, from uh, team A. So they couldn't possibly cope because of their interpretations of what was viable to them and what their objectives were. And I think the most, I think one of the most important things we, we were sort of looking at doing, and I, I thought about this at the time, it'd been great if we had had a, a policy document, you know, to support the program of work because it was really complicated between three different organizations. You know, that this is what, this in, in the event of uh, conflicts, this is what needs to be done. Yeah. But everyone was just, uh, what, what's the best way to describe it? Left to go on with it and sort yeah. out the situation and get it over the line. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. So if I were to pick up on the common themes that all three of you have uh, just described, 
I'm going to use the dreaded G word now. Is this an issue oh, of dear. governance? Yes. Yes. Is Good question. For me, governance? it's for me, it's an issue of governance. Yeah. But then again, you 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 get great arguments when you talk about this because people say governance is out of date, governance is old fashioned, governance is no longer relevant in this agile world. But if you look at the wheel and Ross definition of governance, governance is effective decision making. That's what it is. So the, the question is, how can you embed devolve uh, decision making to the lowest possible level? Now, for me, what it comes down to is uh, that's why I love the idle four guiding principles. Focus on value. Okay. Focus on value is the most important guiding principle. And it should be a mindset. It should be at the top of everybody's mind. The most important asset we have is people's time. People are always given too much work to do. That means they have to prioritize their time. They have to be able to decide which of these multiple tasks I've just been given should I do first. And the only way they can decide is by linking it back to value. So they've got to know which value will trump another value at the moment. In that example I gave you, is the value at the moment the product feature, time to market, get this thing out, or is it customer satisfaction and customer loyalty? Only when they heard from the strategic governance layer, customer retention is our most important mm -hmm. driver, then they were able to make a devolved decision. If that's what trumps revenue and small features, then I've got to solve this issue first because it's going to impact the value of customer loyalty. Mm -hmm. So people were able to make the decisions because they now knew what does value look like when you have to make a decision. Sigma, I can see you've been dying to say something, so go ahead. Yes, I, I think that it's so important what Paul says there, and that's um, about empowerment of the people because they have the direction and they are empowered to take decisions on their own. And that also leads back to this uh, kind of... Uh, uh, autonomy in the workplace where they feel they have a saying and they feel they can make the decisions that is also right for uh, the company but uh, uh -huh. they can mm. quick instead of go and ask and yeah. wait a lot of time for yeah. for yeah. decisions on uh, so and um, but but then it uh, I agree with Val uh, focus on value is the most important but then again they need to know what value means. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think they need a discussion uh, also regarding it's not only what uh, uh, decisions that is uh, profitable. Uh, if I make this decision quick or this customer happy, then we will earn more money, sell more products. It's not mm -hmm. only about that, but it should be uh, in, I think, one of the very important things we covered in the drive stakeholder value book is the triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, for our audience who don't know much about it, could you explain that? Yes. So, so usually we have, when we talk about the bottom line in an organization, everything that is good for the bottom line, then we talk about economy and profit. But in the triple bottom line, we, in the value, value def definition in the company. Uh, we are stating that we have a triple bottom line that uh, it's uh, both profit, but also the planet and the uh, people. Yeah. People uh, or pr uh, profit, planet and people is kind of uh, equally important. So whatever you do in the company, have these three uh, kind of visions in your head. Does it, mm -hmm. does it allow us to earn money? Yes. But is it still good for people and community and those things? Yes. And is it still uh, good for environment and not? Uh, because we need uh, the whole world and all companies in the world to have this in mind if we are going in the right direction in the world. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And, and it's not just me. I think. Um, uh, you know, for the last uh, month or two, I've seen uh, Rob England on LinkedIn and Twitter talk yeah. about values over value. Yeah. Yeah. This, this notion that uh, uh, staying true to our values, our personal values, our organizational values, yeah. our societal values, etc., should trump <clears throat> our um, our attention on 
bottom line on financial value. So we should pay more attention to our values than our value itself. So that I, I completely um, get behind that uh, way of thinking. Mm. Um, I think, I, 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 sorry, Alan, go ahead. I, I was just going to say something about um, uh, Sigma mentioned empowerment as well. Proper governance done properly right yeah. empowers people you know, to make decisions because that's what proper governance does. It's a good decision making yeah. forum. And I think maybe it needs to be some, ITO 4 covers that really, really well, I think, that it's make, making decisions, but empowering people to make the decisions as well. Because the dangerous thing for organizations, it takes a long time, using Paul's example, to go up the chain. Yep. And that can cause a lot of damage to organizations where yep. people are leaving because it's not it's not customer retention and the product owner saying, it's all about producing features for me, not about customer retention. So that's where organizations have really got to get this right because the time it takes to say, yep. hey, we've got a problem and then sort it out, they could lose lots and lots and lots of not just employees, but customers as well. And, and that's, that's I love, uh, one of the reasons I love focus on value so much is because it provokes a discussion of value for whom. Yeah. And that then leads you to identify your stakeholders. And uh, sometimes it can lead you to identify stakeholders that you might not have originally thought of when designing your yeah. product or designing your service. And it forces you in some ways to take a, a much more holistic view, I suppose. But I'm going to throw one challenge out there. And I'll start with Alan because... You know, you, the work that you do, Alan, obviously divides, uh, spans the divide between projects and programs and, and portfolio management, as well as sort of the, the BAU operations world. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about how uh, there can be conflict within organizations where different teams have a different perspective on what value means. And yes, we have to get people around the table and or around a Zoom call and discuss this and try to thrash it out. But what if you can't? What do you do if you actually cannot reconcile the difference? That, Is this um, something that you have you have encountered in your um, careers? Uh, I've uh, not encountered it, thankfully, within my Axelos career. But I've actually encountered it uh, before, before that, whereby um, I took over uh, a project whereby the it was the. I think what had happened was the marketplace had changed. And so the product now was no longer fit for use, et cetera, and was not going to be uh, accepted by business as usual. And uh, business as usual had their own uh, targets, et cetera, which basically were different to the project. And the project itself was in, was in a problem, in a problematic state because the, the, the actual um, marketplace had changed. The only way we got around that was that by basically, I mean, what we had to do with the project is close the project down because it was there was no way that the business as usual would accept the product. So that was part of it, closing it down, minimize the damage to the organization and minimize cost. But making sure for the next one within that organization is that as early as possible, this is what the value of this project will bring to business as usual. And having the business as usual people present, present at the start of, of the project. Mm. What's your opinions? How does the future look good for you using this product? This is what the business needs to do. And I think that was because at that time, I think there was, uh, I think it was ultra governance, I think was a description in the organization. It was too much control and, um, and then it went from one lot of control to lack of control, whereas with the change in the organizational structure, there was more decisions being made quickly. So mm. business as usual uh, had no surprises. It always comes back to, um, there was this operational manager with, within business as usual who basically said to me uh, after the close down of the project, says, I only like surprises at Christmas. <laughs> and I remember taking that on board and saying, okay, well, so, that, so December twenty fifth, everything blows up, right? Yeah, That's... yeah, 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 something like that. <laughs> so uh, I took that on board. So what they what I tried to do was basically this is what we need to do is to be successful within the organisation, having a joint view and vision of what was valuable to business as usual and how the project was going to help that and get mm -hmm. buy in. And then what we started to do with the team was then the the team had the objectives, but they had a shared 
idea of the value taking place. But that needed a, a, a good governance structure within the organization, which allowed us to make decisions, correct decisions quickly. You know? and, and there's an, another point that to, to, to answer yours, actually, because we see this all the time, this conflict of decision making. It comes back now to informed decision making. And that comes back to collaborate and promote visibility, which is another great guiding principle. Yeah. You need to have the right stakeholders together, collaborate, and you've got to promote visibility. What do I mean by that? I tell, you've heard me ask thousands of people this question, actually, what's the definition of a service according to ITIL? And worldwide, less than 5% can answer it. And then I say it's about value, outcomes, costs, and risks. It's a balance of those things. So informed decision making comes back to in those conflicts. Okay, nice that you're forcing us to do your value, your outcome, your feature, but what about the downstream costs and risks of dropping this piece of work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do this because you want the value and outcome, fine, it's your decision, but this is the consequences in terms of costs and risks. Are you prepared to accept the downstream costs and risks? Mm -hmm. When you can actually present the information, then you get a totally different dialogue. And we've had chief executive officers and chief operating officers in the simulation suddenly say, oh, wow, now that you show me this, I'm going to make a different decision. Mm. <clears throat> but unfortunately, as you see, we don't even know the term value outcomes, costs and risks. So we don't even know in IT what information we should be giving back to the business to make an informed decision. And because we can't give them the right information, I totally agree with them. The number two chosen worst practice ABC card worldwide is everything's got the highest priority according to the users. They will overrule us every single time because we don't know how to present back value in terms of value, outcomes, costs and risks and consequences. That's true. And that's how you need to deal with those conflicts. And that's when it comes back to, sorry, again, actually, your question of co-create value. This is co-create. Yeah, Bring the people together and say, the most important asset we have is time. We've got too much work for the time available, which means we have to make an informed decision as to which value are you now prepared to give up. And so long as you can make that visible, somebody will say, OK, I don't like it, but that value I'm prepared to lose to gain this value. And if we so, don't have those dialogues and discussions, we're never, ever going to win this. Yeah, so this opens a very interesting line of questioning. In fact, the last question I had for the panel discussion, but I've been preempted by uh, the, uh, a very smart gentleman in our audience, John Custy, who <laughs> asks us, value, uh, who says, value needs some quantification. How would you actually quantify value? And how would it then, uh, that quantification, be able to pro help stakeholders prioritize what work needs to be done? How would you quantify value to link better to strategic direction? So we, we've talked about, and Sigma rightly pointed out in the, the definition that, that Eitel talks about, uh, as, as, uh, and Alan also mentioned from uh, management of value. We, th there's a very important word in this definition of value, and that is uh, uh, subjective. Value is subjective. Yep. It changes depending on who you ask. And Paul, as you rightly pointed out, it depend, uh, It also changes depending on time of day or time of year that you ask them. Hmm. So how do you actually measure value? And in such a way that it, you, you can analyze it, you can detect patterns in it. You know, how do you actually quantify value? Um, Sigma, I'll come to you first uh, as well with this question because you, you were the one who... who use that word subjective so you know you put yourself in this um <laughs> how, how would you how would you advise your your customers who come to you with this question how do i measure value so, so what uh, i think companies are used to is again back to economic uh, wings uh, in that area they uh, measure value in uh, kind of how much cost and how much uh, uh, can we lower the cost, etc., and how much can we increase income? So in that area, it's uh, a lot of measures already in the in the companies. But what the poll and uh, also is, it, it's uh, um, I, I think we need uh, this um, measurement and visibility in uh, all the different levels of the organization. 
organization and even we outside in uh, organization. So how to measure value for uh, the employees and the individuals working with it. So they are not, for example, uh, overloaded, uh, uh, having stress uh, uh, over a, a very long period of time and uh, mm -hmm. All the other things define what means what is value for them and then for the project or and then for the organization and then also what is value according to the uh, kind of uh, 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 according to the services we deliver and the difference that makes in the world outside the the organization as well so we yeah. To quantify, uh, it could be uh, how um, on, on the team, on the lowest level, is uh, uh, employee satisfaction measures, and all up to kind of how are we able to increase the uh, recyclability of our products. Right. Yes, it it, could, um, let, let, let it me, comes. It comes back to first. You've got to know what the strategic goals are. Yes. And, and this is why one of the biggest secrets that Isaka ever made from COVID was the goals cascade. Mm -hmm. They kept it a big secret and never told anything, whereas the goals cascade is the most important instrument for a CIO to enter into a dialogue with the business. What are the strategic goals? Now, they're broken into a balanced perspective. What are your strategic revenue generating goals? What are your strategic innovation and growth goals? What are your strategic learning and operational excellence goals? What are your strategic customer or employee goals? It just comes back to what are the top strategic goals? Now, a survey from MIT actually showed as well, less than one in four business managers even knows their own strategic goals. And yet these business managers are the ones telling us their IT project is the most important IT project. So if the business doesn't even know what the strategic IT goals are, and these are the people dumping all these hundreds of opportunities and demands on us, we've got no chance. So it comes back to if you know what the strategic goals are, now they're different for every company, so you can't answer John's question. If one of the strategic goals happens to be customer growth and customer loyalty, mm -hmm. okay, now you can look at which IT projects, which IT metrics could influence customer loyalty. Okay, so let me let me stop you there because now this provokes a lot of questions in my mind, because you can definitely define certain metrics that align with strategic goals, yeah. but would it not be better to maybe define a set of tension metrics? So yes, we want um, employee, uh, yes we want um, customer satisfaction, but not at the cost of employee satisfaction. But just yep. to that's where mm -hmm. you have balanced scorecards, and that's where yeah. the governance comes in place. Governance yes. helps deals with those tensions. And if you don't have an effective governance mechanism to say, how do we make a rapid decision when these tensions arise, then you're just going to get conflict and whoever's got the biggest mouth will actually win. Mm. And, <laughs> and it comes back to your question, actually, how important is governance? Governance is critical if you want yeah. to deal with this. Mm. I think it's also important, you know, the governance is so important, but it, I think it's also important to manage value deliberately instead of leaving it as a byproduct. Yeah. That's where organizations, yeah. oh, it's too difficult, or it's yeah. another management activity, mm. which is yeah. like, or in the US have called it the prairie dog syndrome, that's someone else's problem. We've, we've yeah. sorted ours. And we can't have that because organizations are it's so important. And it goes back to what Paul was saying about the strategic objectives, yeah. you know, endorsed by the CEO. You know, yeah. you know, the the C suite, the C suite need to say, well, this is what is valuable to our organisation. And at this at, at this moment in time, that yeah. could change. And it's equally that's where you get communications, etc., and they disseminate the information to key stakeholders. So you don't have the situation that being Sigma had. You go into an organisation trying to sort some something out. Yeah. And there's no guidance. <laughs> So I'm gonna I'm gonna pa I'm gonna pause here because uh, we could talk for another hour on this, uh, but there, there's a lot of other questions coming in, and um, just in the interest of time, I, I want to get to some of these questions because honestly, some of these questions we could spend like another panel discussion just talking about this stuff. But I'm I'm, I'm cherry picking some of the questions that have been sent to me. Um, 
And so for the audience, I do apologize if I don't get to your question, but what we want to do after the live session is to maybe get an extract of this chat and have a look at some of the other intriguing questions that have come in and figure out how we might be able to um, address those questions for you. So um, hopefully a quick one. Uh, Ishmael Thomas uh, asks, can the word value be translated to mean utility? That's an idle semantics question. I'll put that over to somebody who's got an idle certificate. So I'll, 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 I'll give you my perspective on this. It's not just utility. I mean, if we, if we go back to this, the definitions of utility, warranty, et cetera, we, it's talking about fit for purpose, fit for use. Yeah. One of the wonderful pieces uh, of guidance that got put into the Drive Stakeholder Value book, which uh, Sigma was a part of, is that you need to be able to measure not only utility and warranty, but you also need to be able to measure experience. Yeah. And it's the three of them oh, that matter. Nice. So value is not just utility. Value is some sort of a combination or configuration of utility, warranty, and experience. And I thought that was an absolutely brilliant takeaway for from the from the book. Yeah. And uh, just, so do you have anything that was that one of yours? <laughs> At least my team. And uh, and uh, as I said, when you just have utility and not warranty, you have no value. That that is true. It's absolutely. Not <laughs> um, moving on, uh, David Kelly asks, how can we write value into contracts, or do we need to write value into contracts? Uh, I find when customers feel they're getting value, they don't ever really worry about contracts. When, when, when they're unhappy, they hold you to account. Mm -hmm. I think we've all been there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. how, do you, how do you write value into contracts? Do you need to write value into contracts? And to an extent, Paul, I think this also touches upon what you were saying about people blindly following SLAs, because that's what the SLA says, rather than mm -hmm. necessarily that's what value means now. Mm -hmm. What I yeah. yeah. Just, no, go ahead, Sigma. Uh, what I have seen is uh, a smart thing to build the uh, kind of into the contract a way of working so that we are not longer defining value one role in the contract because value changes and the perspective of value changes, the strategy changes, the marketplace changes. So in the contract could also include working in a more agile way, communicate more. Uh, uh, put kind of how we are going to work with relationship management and development of the uh, relationship together. Yeah, yeah, relationship management is critical because really it comes down to, we've been talking about this for years, business IT alignment, business IT convergence, business IT fusion. Really, we should be building relationships where we're all working towards the same strategic goals rather yeah. than trying to defend ourselves on contracts and fixing it down service levels. It comes down to, are we delivering the right value? Are they I, 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 do, I do think there's something here. Sorry, Alan, go ahead. And I, I think that's, Paul, I think that's why people get defensive because they don't know because they haven't been told. Yeah. They get defensive. They say, we don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so, I, you know, going, echoing some of the thoughts that have been expressed here, I think there's definitely something into... Uh, when when writing contracts to say this is what value means at the time of writing the contract, but yes. we will revisit this state statement or series of statements um, every three months or, or something like that. But there is also an aspect to this question, which I think if you follow if you start following that train of thought, it also means that as a service provider organization or as a consumer organization, you have to be willing to enter into that debate. Yep. And it's not just at the point of consumption. It's also you have to be able to get your procurement and your legal guys and all the other yep. supporting functions committed to actually making changes to the contract and um, you know renegotiating when it needs to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that is a much larger cultural and governance change than it yep. is just to the actual contract defining how services are going to be consumed. Mm -hmm. I agree. But I think it's I think it's so important to, to get it right and take we take that extra time at that sort of level within the organization to organization inter organization to make it work. I think uh, this, it's so important. There's one we we'll probably have time for two more questions. One's coming very specifically about project management, which Alan, I'll I'll ping over to you first. Uh, Sam 
Inquiti, and Sam, I apologize if I mispronounce that name, uh, asks, uh, for any kind of project work, is it possible to gain sign off on how value is defined by each group or stakeholder involved? Or is there a way to prevent changes in the value of the project, especially when strategic goals change? So yeah. first part, is it possible to gain a sign off on how value is defined by each group or stakeholder? And second part, is there a way to prevent changes in how value is defined? Well, the, the first one would be, you know, if you, if you the, the best way to do that within a project environment would be to use, uh, try and embed MOV within the organization. So you have a framework which is going to allow you to implement the project and then it's signed up by the organization. Uh, and that would be the recommendation there. So you can actually use that uh, in, 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 from a functional value perspective, how the project's going to work. The second part of the question, uh, projects change um, and they change all the time. And um, and this is where it goes back to what we've all discovered, uh, discussed before, governance. So you can manage the changes effectively. But with using reason points through as an example, but if you don't, then you need the governance, the exception to get the decision done as quickly as possible. So the value can be uh, agreed and signed off before that. That's important, but it, it can't it can't prevent changes yeah. happening. Mm. But you need to. Yeah. But you, that's where the governance comes in. And this is this is why you see as well the development uh, organizational change towards product teams, yeah, and agile project management and minimal viable product and minimum time to value. So you're breaking things down into smaller and smaller chunks, knowing that what you thought was valuable in the beginning changes over time because the world is changing so fast. It's That's something true. you've got to accept and build in. This is a fact. This is a fact for the future. And if you try yeah. to fix a long-term project, that's what you wanted, that's what you get, no changing in, in between, you've got to ask yourselves, are we actually delivering value or just trying to make sure that we can improve the percentages of projects finished on time? Mm. Sure. Uh, and Sigma, you were, you were trying to jump in to say something as, as Paul was talking. Yes, I, I think in a, kind of when starting off a project, of course, you need uh, the stakeholders that want the results of this project to sign off what of uh, kind of the value that uh, they need. But I think the most important is to to force the uh, sorry. <laughs> The, to force the, uh, the stakeholders to describe their needs yeah. and the problems yeah. they have instead of describing we the value we want is this and this solution yeah. because uh, the project and the agile way of working will find out how as long as yeah. the yeah. customer really describe the big need and the problems they want yeah. to solve with this project. Mm. Yep. Mm. Uh, and in fact, that's a, a question that came in from uh, Syed Anan Ali, which is around whether moving to an agile and iterative delivery uh, method, uh, as we, we you've described, is a better way of continuously creating uh, or co-creating value by delivering these short uh, sprints to to the stakeholders. And I think there's something there again that it's it's contextual. I mean, if you were building yeah. a bridge for this. If yep. you build a bridge, you sort of know what the outcome is going to be yep. and you can mm. structure the program or project yep. accordingly. The one thing I do uh, sometimes think about is one of the fundamental philosophies in this sort of agile or iterative way of working is start where you are and then try to figure out how you can incrementally nudge your product or your service in the direction you want. And mm. sometimes I wonder, does this then blind the organization to opportunities to actually, you know what, this is coming out of left field and it's going to be a game changer. So no matter how much more we incrementally improve over here, that is going to just eat our cake. Mm. And we've got to sort of just stop, rip this out and actually go with something else. Mm. Um, and so I think the uh, to Syed's question, I think the uh, method in which you deliver uh, these products and services and projects and co-create value is very, very contextual. Yep. So even though you yep. may have some short-term iterative ways you cannot be you cannot intend blind yourself to big disruptive changes that may be coming which will allow you to take that massive leap mm. uh, forward I, i'd also like to say that from, from the agile perspectives it's so important still to have that governance 
and the agreement about the strategic objectives within the organization. So you've got that clarity. Mm. Because I mean, using using agile within our governance structure is marvelous for a project manager because you, you can see how much budget is being burned and you can see the product being generated, which the stakeholders value, but unfortunately they value it subjectively. That's but true. Uh, you need that governance structure there to do that. That's true. Unfortunately, we've come up to the top of the hour. Uh, and I'm going to have to call time there just because I know for some of us uh, and some of our audience, in fact, it's it's pretty late. Um, I saw a tweet come by from somebody who I know is in India where it's probably coming up to almost midnight, maybe even past midnight. I'm not sure. Yet. Uh, but to our lovely audience, thank you so much for being with us for the last hour um, and listening to us talk about this uh, this uh, topic. Uh, it's a perennial hot topic. Uh, and we're, we're happy to maybe extend this discussion, but we want to hear from you, our audience. If you can email us at ask at axelos.com and tell us your thoughts. Tell us how you uh, found this uh, panel discussion, how you found the YouTube live stream to work out, um, how you found the use of LinkedIn events, etc., as well as the content actually discussed. We'd love to take your feedback. We want to deliver more and more content into your eyes and ears and hands. Uh, but we need your help to be able to do that. So let me uh, wrap up here by thanking Sigma, Alan, Paul, and of course, two wonderful people who are off camera right now, but have been feeding me lots of questions. And that's Harry Freeman, our producer, and uh, Rasha Akar, who's our social media manager. Thanks both you guys uh, for helping pull this wonderful session together. Uh, until next time, everyone, uh, stay safe, wear a mask, and please wash your hands. Yeah.